always, you know, this is, this would be good catch-up for you today, all right? So if you haven't been to 101, if you're looking to come to Believer's Fellowship, this is, this is your introduction, all right? But uh, the, the idea behind all this is to keep us all on the same page and to keep unified in what our purpose is and what our goals are and what God has called us to do. So we'll, we'll do a little rehashing today. One thing that we dealt with in our pastor's conference when I met with just with Tim and Gary and I and then came back and our elders was is simplifying our, our statement. You know, we have this statement. It goes something like this, that the purpose of our church is to bring, there's five M's if you've been around, you'll know what they are. To bring people into membership into the body of Christ, into Jesus Christ and his body so that they might mature in their walk with God, and they might find their ministry in the church of God so that they might magnify the Lord in their mission in the world. So those are the, uh, I think mission comes before magnify because it's our ultimate goal for all of us to magnify the Lord. So we've broken this down, made it even more simple, and we, we kind of melted it all down into three statements, and it's, you know, it's about seven words. So that's a whole lot easier than memorizing that paragraph I just gave you. So that if people ask you what Believer's Fellowship, you, you don't have to go, well, I believe it goes something like this. We bring people into membership in the body of Christ so that they might mature in their walk with Christ. So that, you know, now you can just, it, it breaks down to what you see on the top of the screen there. We love God, we love people, and reach the world. That's what all that boils down to. And simply in a nutshell, that's what our life boils down to, not only as, as a church, but as individuals. You're here to do what? If you follow the scriptures, is you love God, you love people, reach the world. That's what a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ is. And so as we share this today, we'll, 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 we'll talk about what that means and how that plays into everything that we're doing and how there's not only a purpose statement for us, it really is describing our, our process. So no matter where you are today, and maybe you've been a long time member of the church, maybe you've been through the class a couple of times, I don't know, or maybe it's just all fresh to you, I'm trusting that the Lord will just use this and restore and the, the passion that we all have for doing God's work and being part of the kingdom. Because again, it's really all about him, is it not? And I find that my, I myself get frustrated with church even when I start making it about me and myself and my preference, what I want. It always has to come back to what is the Lord up to and, and what's he doing. When we began in evangelism many years ago, it was a desire coming out of those many years of evangelism to, to, to start where so many seemed to be failing and not that all were, but it just seemed to be what we were seeing, what the Lord was burdening my heart with and Kathy's heart with, is the fact that we weren't seeing a lot of disciple making I've shared even recently a meeting with pastors talking about the decline in America's church today. He said, my, my personal belief is that, you know, we're not making disciples. And if we are, we're making disciples that don't make disciples, all right, that, that they don't carry out the ministry. It's like Jeremiah said, we have produced many strange children. And he's talking about the children of Israel are supposed to be a very unique group of people, holy unto the Lord, but, and they were supposed to bring the, the, word, the word to the nations, but yet they didn't, all right? And they began to be involved with the world and preoccupied with the world and the false religions and the false gods and all that got blended in. And Jeremiah says, we have produced strange children. Now, I know we're pretty much all strange, but hopefully not in that way. Amen? So the Bible even says in the New Testament, we'll be strange to the world. We don't, want that. We, don't want, we don't mind that. We just don't want to be strange to God and strange to his plan and purposes for our life. If you study the scriptures, that's pretty much, it, it, you begin to see a, a, some, some, some things laid out very clearly in scripture, all right? But we start with this statement today in, in the word of God that, that says, listen, you're no longer strangers and foreigners, but you're fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Now, if you're a Christian, that's what God has done in you. You're no longer strangers to him. You're part of his family. You're part of his church. You're part of his bride. And you're, you are, you're part of the members of God. First Corinthians, I believe chapter 5 says, we are now individual members. All right, we're all individual members. And it says, in the body of Christ. We all have individual part and place to pay in the bigger picture as, as, as members of the body of Christ. One thing that I personally believe the Bible teaches that once we come to Jesus Christ, we are part now of the family of God. And the church itself is in the family of God and part of the family of God. We are the family of God. We're the earthly representation, the very body of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is our head. We are his personal representative. We are the ambassadors of Christ. And we individually make up the whole body of Christ. That's the way God has intended it. That's why Jesus died so he might birth this bride of his called the church to reach the world. So we're a family. Now, I think it becomes clear at that point that God expects us all to be a member of a family. All right? Uh, you, you were born into a family, whether you became an orphan or whatever else, I don't know, but you were part of a family. In Christianity, when you're born again, 
God births you into this unique family called the church. People say, well, I don't like church. Well, you don't like your family is what you're saying. Your family is, 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 is what God has put together for you. And I talk to people a lot about, you know, obviously, because I'm out and about, and I ask people where they go to church or do they know the Lord, those kind of questions all the time. But one the, when I ask people about where they go to church, I usually get, if they're not really a member of a church, I get one or two answers. One goes like this. I'm a member of, and then they name the largest church in the area. To which I usually say, uh, what's that pastor's name again? And if they can't tell me the pastor's name, it's pretty obvious, you know. They... And then I start asking about the church, the ministry of the church, and what service they go to. I know they have multiple services, and it becomes real obvious. That's just their scapegoat of anybody asking where they go to church, all right? Now, a lot of people go to the larger church and community. That's understandable. But there's a lot of people just use that as an excuse. And so uh, that's not what the Lord wants. God wants you to be a part of a church. The other one is, I'm a member of the universal church. And basically saying, you know, I worship universally. That's usually the guy that says, I'm on the golf course, I'm worshiping. And he's lying, he's playing golf, right? I'm on the lake, I'm fishing, I'm worshiping God in creation. It, you know, that's not what the Bible teaches about church. The Bible talks about local churches, pastors, elders, deacons, ministries, ministers, and gifts being exercised in that functioning body. That's what the New Testament church is, all right? And God wants us to be a member functioning somewhere in some regard. In fact, there's a lot of times that the word church is used in Scripture. There's only about three times when it's used in Scripture when it's talking about the universal, all people that are Christians. Most of the other verses, the majority of the other verses where it mentions the word church have to do with a local fellowship, with a new community of people who come together to bring the kingdom of God to bear in their communities and to glorify God together. So I think it's very clear that God expects us through Scripture, as we teach it, to be a member. If you're not a member, you're just an orphan, all right? God expects you to be a part of his family and to be an active part in the body of Christ. And if you're missing this and you're not doing this, then you're certainly missing out on the mark that God has for you. So when we come together and we start talking about this in our 101 class, we basically the goal of what we're trying to do here is to get everybody who comes to be a part of the church on the same page. I remember before we started in the 101 class, this journey class we call it, one of the reasons we did it was because we were having people who would come join the church and then they would leave the church within weeks or months, if not immediately. <laughs> in other words, they'd come to church, they'd join the church on the first Sunday they attend, you'd never see them again. They didn't get it, right? They didn't understand what we were talking about. Or they would come to church and they would be there for a few months and say, well, that's not what I believe. And then they start sharing what they believe, and it was contrary to what the church as a whole believed, and so they were unhappy. Best thing they could have done for me to have done for them is to have a new members class where they could send it before they join and say, here's what, here's what the church believes. Here, here's, where we're, here's where we stand, and here's what we're all about. What we do at Believer's Fellowship should always be understood in the context of this book. This is the foundation. Wouldn't you agree? This is the foundation. And if you're looking for a church, you'd always make sure in your own heart and mind and life that you can confirm that's a Bible-based church. Their foundation is the Lord Jesus Christ, and they're not building on opinions. They're not building on some denominational opinions. They're building on what does the Bible have to say. So we have what we call in our church, in our, our journey class, what we call scriptural statements that, that define very clearly. And as we've gone through after meeting with our pastors and going through this material, I've, I've even redefined some of this material to make it even more simple to understand that, you know, it's about loving God, loving people, and reaching the world. And our scripture statements, you know, we, we call these the Great Commission and the Great Commandment in Scripture, right? But here's, here's the way it, it breaks down, and if we understand what these scripture statements are, the first one we look at is, is Matthew 22, where the Lord Jesus says to them, you know, you'll love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, all your soul, all your mind, and this is the great and the foremost commandment, and the second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So the foundation of what we're doing is what Jesus has called us to do. We love God. We love our neighbors. As we love ourselves, we love people. Add to that, not just this great commandment, but what we call the great commission. When he says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe whatsoever I've commanded you, and lo, I am with you always to the end of the age. Jesus said, you're going to accompany me in this kingdom work of reaching the world for Jesus Christ. Bottom line, what is the church about? The bottom line for the church is not about a ministry that I prefer, an activity that I long to see, a something I want to be a part of, that maybe they just, you know, do they have game rooms in the youth department? Do they have this? And, you know, no. The bottom line for the church is not all that stuff, all right? 
what really is the bottom line for the church, love God, love people, reach the world. Is that simple enough for you? So if anybody should ask you at any given time in your life, what's Believer's Fellowship all about? The core of what we're about is we do what? Love God, love people, reach the world. So you ought to be able just to share that simply with anybody that should ask you. What does y'all, y'all's church do? What, what are y'all about? We love God, we love people, and we reach the world. That's what our heart's desire is. Now, 1 Corinthians, Paul is writing to the church in his first letter, and he's telling them the importance of unity, that you get this down and you have this down together, all right? And he said, listen to what he says in 1 Corinthians 1.10. He makes this statement to them. He said, listen, I plead with you, brethren. In other words, I'm begging you by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that you all speak the same thing, that you all speak the same thing and that there be no division among you so that you may be, you be, you be perfectly joined together, the same mind and the same judgment. Everything we do, you know, we want, to, we want to, to align up with God's Word. So if we're going to have the same mind, it's not you agreeing with me, me agreeing with you. It's us agreeing with what God has written and what God has said to us. I mean, really, isn't that what it's all about? We have a tendency to, to all too often in church to make it about myself. Listen to what Living Bible, and I have it up on the screen. Let there be real harmony among you. That's not, not pretend harmony, not pretend unification. Let there be real harmony among you so there won't be a split in the church. I plead with you to be of one mind, united in thought and united in purpose. There it is. So what is our thought and what is our purpose? Is Jesus is Lord, and he's called us to love God, the Father, and, and to love the world, to love people, and to reach the world. So we love God, we love each other, and we're reaching out to see other people come to Jesus Christ. So in a nutshell, if you like nutshells, all right, let's put it this way. You love God, love people, reach the world. In this, folks, these three simple statements, we find our purpose as well as our process. The goal of our church is to be faithful to that commission and the command that God's given us, and especially in Matthew 28 when he says to make disciples. Make disciples. What's your goal? We make disciples. How do you do that? We love God. We love, we love people and reach the world. What does a disciple do? He loves God. He loves people and reaches the world. If you're not loving God and loving people and reaching the world, you're not a disciple because this is what it's really all about. I mean, you can't get it much more boiled down to one central point and one central theme than that. Praise God for believers' fellowship. Because this church began with that purpose and mindset in day one. Let's make disciples. Not make disciples who just kind of come to church. That's not a disciple. Not make the church who people just kind of attend a class. That's not a disciple, all right? Disciples love God, love people, and reach the world. And so it becomes not only the the purpose, it can really be the process and even be an exam for me. Do I really love God? You know, if I love God, certainly I'm going to love the church because God gave his son that the church might exist. So I'm going to love corporate worship. I'm going to love fellowship. I'm going to love coming together with the people of God. And as I do that, guess what? God births in my heart a love for people, for each other, for responding within the body of Christ to receive. Do we all have the same ideas? No. Do we all have the same agree, uh, opinion about stuff? No. Do we all like red and green or blue is our favorite color? No. You know, do we all like Dr. Pepper? No, you like this and you like that. I mean, that's not the issue, you know. You all like to wear jeans, you like to wear slacks. That's not the issue. Well, if you don't wear slacks, you're not. Come on. <laughs> Love God. Love people. Reach the world. In 1988, that's the way it started. And here we are, 40-something years later, 30-something years later now, and we're still staying about the course. Do we kind of go through stages at times where God has to reteach us and bring us back to focus. Obviously, we have that in our own spiritual lives as much less with the church life, right? But we want to stay true to the course. So that began in 2007. We started another campus in, the Mag- in Montgomery County, Magnolia Pinehurst, and we're there today. And God has blessed this church because I believe it's because we've kept it right. We've, we, when, we've, when we've steered off course, we've always steered back to course. We've had an an awesome commitment to one another to let's stay true to the gospel and stay true to the world. And it's been exciting to see what God has done. I believe with all my heart that Believer's Fellowship is a genuine life illustration of what it means to love God, love people, and reach the world. We're moving out in all these places. and Go ahead and praise the Lord. We worship together. We work together. We move forward together with a common heart and a common mind. And often we get distracted, yes, but we'll come back to the truth. Now, it's important if we're going to do this is you have the same mind and you have the same purpose. 
Now, we do in our, our 101 class, we put out a doctrinal statement. We have doctrinal statements that we put out. You can see them online at bfchurch.com. We have some printed up, and they're, they're on that back table right over here. There's a stack of them. It has a doctrinal statement and a lifestyle statement. But it basically tells you what, what we believe based upon what does the Bible say. What do we believe about God? What do we believe about Jesus? What do we believe about the Holy Spirit? What do we believe, you know, about certain theology and doctrine, heaven, hell, all these things. And we need to, we need to realize as, as we look at something like that, whether you're looking at doctrinal statement for Believer's Fellowship or any other church, it needs to line up with what the Bible says. The Bible, not the Book of Mormon, not the Jehovah Witness version. What does the Holy Word of God say without people going and manipulating it to say what they want to say? The Bible says it is not for any private interpretation. So we take our doctrine, which means teachings, from the Bible. What does the Bible have to say about this? So that's the basis for all the doctrine. If you want to look at the details of it, we talk about a lot of different things. We even talk about marriage and remarriage in that doctrinal statement. You can see all that right there. What we believe about free will and predestination, that's in our doctrinal statement. You know, I think that the church for the most part, and I don't think this is true of our church, but church in general in America, it's pretty illiterate. That's why, you know, that you see such fast growth among, someone told me several years ago that the fastest growing part of the Mormon church was Baptist church members coming out of the Baptist and becoming Mormons. Well, that's some really dumb Baptists. I mean, I hate to tell you that. They just didn't know the Bible. If they'd have read the Bible, they'd say, what? That's ridiculous. The Bible doesn't teach that. It doesn't even lean that way. So we look at the Bible and what does it say? Now, I'm not trying to hurt your feelings, all right? I'm just saying sometimes we need to adjust our feelings before we try to adjust the Bible you know, to try to fit our frame of reference. But we also put back there, as we talked about eternity and salvation and people and spiritual gifts, you know, and all these issues, even our denominational affiliation is explained in that doctrinal statement. We also talk about what I consider equally as important because it, it's what comes out of doctrine is what we call our lifestyle statements, all right? And in our lifestyle statements, it talks about because we believe the Bible, this is how we live our lives. You see, if we come to Christ, the Bible says we're new creatures, right? So if I've been made a new person, and I really believe I've become this, I'm not what I used to be when I give my life to Jesus Christ, what I do changes. It became very apparent in, in many of your lives that when you gave your heart and life to Christ, the course changed, all right? The direction changed for your life and what you do. Now, what I do as a Christian now is not what makes me a Christian. You understand it? Because I'm not saved by my works. It's because I am a Christian, all right? Dogs bark because they're what? Cats don't bark. They're not dogs. Cats meow. All right? You do what you do because you are what you are. I lived a lifestyle of sin because I was a sinner. Christ changed me. Amen? I, I became a believer in Christ. And so now what I do is still the struggle with that old sin nature. But now what I do is to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. So there's lifestyle statements, and they're important. What are they? Well, if we talked about what our theology is and what we believe about the Bible then it means that we believe, really, the Bible is our sole authority. One body, there's one spirit, there's one Lord, there's one faith, there's one baptism, one God, and the Father of us all. There's not five gods, 16 gods, multiple ways to heaven. There's just one God, one Savior, one Lord, all right? And if we believe that, all right, then my lifestyle begins to change. And if I believe that, guess what? I can have unity with you. If you believe that, we can have unity with others. But it's important that we have unity on these essential beliefs, all right? So if I believe it, what happens? Listen, there's going to be unity. But not only believing it will be unity, what about some things we might not agree on? Well, we should always agree on the major things, the doctrine of the Word of God. But there's some things that are just what the Bible refers to as non-essentials. I love that passage here. You might take it to heart. Who are you to judge someone else's servant? All right? He says, why? Because to his own master he stands or fall. He said, Everybody, each one of us is going to give an account to God of himself. All right? So just don't be judging each other. You ever get in that mode where you kind of get the feeling you're just kind of the judge? Don't look at me like that. We all do. You know, you get that attitude. I can't believe they did this, and I can't believe they're not that. And I can't, can you imagine they said this? Hey, God's, God's their God, not you. You know, so, let, you know, there's a lot of non-essential stuff, though, that people in church get all bent out of shape about. You know, it, it, most church splits don't happen because of theology and doctrine. They happen because of philosophy. 
our opinion. This is the way I think it ought to happen. Therefore, you know, you, you start your little movement, you know, try to get everybody to agree with you. That's why the Bible says, no, the non-essentials, we have liberty. And we've had people in our church that, you know, they, they believe different about some things than I believe. I believe, uh, say, and here's an illustration, the second coming of Jesus Christ. That's an, an essential doctrine. If you're going to be a part of Believer's Fellowship, that's a doctrine you're going to have to embrace. Right? Jesus is coming again. Why? Because the Bible says it's so. Now, you may feel, we've had members this way before, who felt like Jesus may come in the middle of the tribulation, as the Bible talks about in Scripture, in Daniel and Revelation. There'll be a seven-year period of tribulation. And they believe that in the middle of the tribulation that Jesus is going to come there before what the Bible refers to in the last half of the tribulation called the Great Tribulation. So they believe that Christians will go through the first tribulation, but not through great tribulation, all right? And then there's some who believe that Jesus will come at the end of the tribulation and deliver them, this be the second. And then myself, I personally believe that Jesus will come prior to the tribulation, all right? So, and the majority probably do here have that same kind of mindset, but here's the deal. It's not gonna cause me to lose any sleep no matter which of those you believe. You know, you're not less spiritual because you might feel one of those other different ways. I'm not more mature because I think I'm right, but neither are you more mature because you think you're right. You know, are you with me on this? We just getting it's like it's, it, Paul was talking about, there are some people in the church who are going down the meat market and buying meat that's been offered to some pagan idol. Get over it. It's cheaper. <laughs> that's pretty much what it came down to, Amen. <laughs> Don't, it's not your job to judge them. You judge, but isn't that uh, what's so typical in church today? People just sit around and judge each other. It's like, here I am. I'm in this place in my spiritual life. Well, you ought to be with me. Well, you just fell down seven steps, all right? <laughs> At that point, you just lost your standing in your place, trying to always drag everybody and make them like you. That's just nothing but opinion. The theology of we don't want to be like me or you. It all want to be like Jesus. Hallelujah. And everybody's at different places. Can you get that? So what do we do? We have liberty, but not only liberty, we also, we show love, we show charity, all right? The Bible says you can have everything in order. You can have great faith to move mountains, but if you don't love your brother, then something's wrong. If you're always about telling how people are, how unspiritual they are, or they're not as spiritual as you, then you're messing the mark completely. All right? That's not your job. God puts some people in places to do things, but it's not, you know, we just miss the mark. It's one thing to reach out and love and carry and encourage and lift and hold up. It's another thing just to be, have an attitude of, of standoffishness when nobody's as spiritual as I am. You just miss the mark. What are these lifestyle statements we're talking about? Well, the lifestyle statement, first and more, again, it gets back to the Word of God. What does the Bible have to say? I mean, that's our question we, we, we address, at least I do, and I think most of you do, when you have decisions you make in life. What does the Bible teach? People all the time have a, they'll come to me and say, I, I, I'm really thinking about this over this. And one guy said, I'm thinking about cremation versus being buried. You know, what does the Bible have to say? And they, but pray, they're heading the right direction. What does the Bible have to say? You know, does the Bible give a clear word on this or is it open to my decision at this point? So we, everything we face, so that's, that's one of the most important things when you come into Believer's Fellowship to remember always that what does the Bible say? Well, Brother Joe, that's just not the way I feel about it. Well, chunk your feelings. Because this is what the Bible says, all right? My feelings are, are, are not first. The Word of God is first. It's how I direct our life. And then we believe one of the important things that our church statements is and lifestyle statements, we believe in the autonomy of the local church. You see, what's that mean? That means there's no denomination or other group of churches that tells us what to do. We participate with other churches. We participate in a denomination, but the denomination doesn't tell us who's going to be our pastor, who's going to, who's going to do this, who's going to serve here, who's going to be there, and who's going to be... Th no, we are the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, and we have one head, and who is it? Jesus Christ. He's the head of the body. So we surrender to him, and as a church... We go to the Word and say, how do we do church? Well, the Bible says you do this, and you have this, and God will call people to this, and God will put people here. And so we respond to the leadership of the Holy Spirit as God sets it up. Now, next Sunday, we'll talk a little bit more about our structure and just rehearse that for where we are. But hey, we also believe in the priesthood of every believer. You don't have to come to me or anybody else around here to get right with God. Somebody say amen, because I'm a mess, and so are you. <laughs> you come to Jesus. But here's the thing about it. If I'm a priest of the Lord, as 1 Peter says, a Revelation, I think 1, 6 right in there, also says the thing that we are priests of the Lord. That means that God can speak to you, all right? Now, when God speaks to you, he'll never contradict what he says in his word because that's not the Lord. That's sometimes our pride can sound just like Jesus. 
<laughs> My pride can. It can mock Jesus real well. But what does is, what is the Lord say? But we can have access to God, each and every one of us. You know what else that means? That means that every one of us that claim the name of Jesus Christ, we all have a ministry. We're all in full-time ministry. We're always representing the king. We're always his representative to the world. We bring people to Christ. We're priests to the Lord. But ultimately, there's just one high priest, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. Not of men, but of God. He's the only one that can save us. He's the only one trained. We believe in the priesthood. That means every one of us have a responsibility in the body of Christ to be what God's called us to be in the body of Christ. We talked about this last week. I won't get into it, about first fruits giving. We participate in serving the Lord with our finances as well as our time and our talents. We believe in honoring the Lord. Scripture has plenty to say about that. You'll have to refer to last week's sermon. There's three more things I want to make clear here. We believe in spirit-led living. All right? You need to hear from God daily. You need to surrender to God daily. You need to trust the Lord daily. Spirit-led means that I'm not running the show anymore. All right? And I don't know about you, but there's lots of time that creates a real conflict in my life. <laughs> Am I the only one? I want to sometimes be Joe-led living. All right? Instead of spirit-led living. So this conflict comes. But what am I going to do at this point? Well, my, if I believe what the Bible says, and I have to live this lifestyle, same says, I'm going to go with what the Father says. And even though I don't want to, even though I don't like it, even though I don't want that, I'm going to do what God says. We also believe in serving, and this is part we'll see in just a moment, of the overall belief of Scriptures. If I believe what the Bible says about the church, and I believe what the Bible says about corporately worshiping together, then I believe part of that will be transferred in our life, that I come to church, all right? The Bible says in Hebrews that not to be like those people who forsake the assembling of themselves together as the manner of some is. In other words, you need to be in church. You need to regularly be a part of the body of Christ. There's something powerful, and I might not be able to understand it all until we get to heaven and really see it on us, really... And, and a, on, a, on a plane that blows all of our minds, there's something exciting and powerful about corporate worship. When we come together in church, not just to be in church, but to worship the Lord together, to pray together, to honor God together, there, there is a spiritual power in place. And some people just don't ever see it because they, they, don't, they don't choose to participate. They come, but, you know, it's more performance-based for them. They watch instead of, instead of participating. We also believe not only that, but in being, being a part of something in a smaller group. And I'll give you the basis again for this in, in Scripture. But we're part where we can, be, we can be a part of people's lives. It's when we isolate ourselves that we get in the most trouble. It's when we fellowship with others, we're in the least amount of trouble. Why? Because there's just some kind of un, unnamed, maybe, or some kind of accountability in that. You know, that we just, we realize I have brothers and sisters. I have a testimony of hold. I have a commitment I've made to other people. I've sought to encourage them. I need to have a life that backs that up, you know, and I need to have a walk that backs that up. So I, it's important that we participate in, in ministry groups. Now, this kind of talks about the fact of going back to our love God, love people, right? And, and loving people especially is, is mostly manifest in our small group studies, majority of which we, we do a lot of different styles, but the majority of them are under the banner of our lift group ministries. We have the other Bible studies and groups that meet together, the grief share. There's lots of ministries that we're doing. But for the most part, what we do in our small groups happens in our lift groups, you know, where, where a lot of ministry takes place. I've used this illustration before. I can preach to the group today, and, 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 and God will speak, and the way, he, the way the Lord moves according to 1 Corinthians is, is that as the Word of God is going forth and we're worshiping together, that people hear from the Lord on different ways. Some receives a word of faith, some receives a word of knowledge, some may receive maybe a healing from the Lord. Somebody, God just moves in, in, the, in, the, in the context of corporate worship in very unique ways. Then we give an invitation, and people come forward to the invitation to respond to what the Lord may have said to them. But... When people come forward to the invitation, it's usually five to seven minutes there. We're not going to meet every part of that person's need that's going in their life. They need, they need an accountability group. They need people to pray with them, hold them up, and encourage them. That's, why we, that's another reason that we do our small groups. Get it plugged in somewhere. You know, there will be people who will stand with you and help you. Uh, 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 just praying over you a few, few minutes, that's marvelous, and that's the first step. But now we follow through by having some disciplines in our life and some commitments in our life to others, and others are committed to us. So we believe it's a very important part of what we're doing. And then obviously, you've never heard me talk about this, have you? <laughs> we're always telling people about Jesus Christ, all right? 1 Peter 3 says, be always ready to give an answer. And sometimes it, the Bible talks about that's when people are asking, but it also says you give an answer before they even ask. That's that we love God, we love people, and reach the world. 
That's kind of wraps it all up right there of what our, our lifestyle statements are and why we do what we do. Now, love God is the first part of this, though. Got that? You, you, how do you love God? The very first step in any of us ever coming to know what it genuinely means to love God is to give our hearts and to give our life to Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, I'm not talking about getting more religion. I tried that once or twice in my life. I tried just saying, you know, I'm just a miserable wreck. I need to do something. I've got to get better. Maybe I just need to go to church. Maybe I need to be a better person. You know, it's kind of like, it's like you've got to turn the old leaf over. and start. I, 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 the old leaf is old on both sides. You know, so turning over a new leaf or whatever, it's still, it's still old on both sides. It's not, a, it's not a new leaf you need. It's new life, all right? And it took me a while to get that down. So I realized what I needed not to be a better person. I need to give my life to Jesus because I'm, you know, pretty much without him, there's, there's no redeeming qualities. Amen. He can literally change me, forgive me of every sin and stain in my life and make me a new person. So our salvation is always the first step of coming to know the Lord Jesus Christ. And you're now children of God. How? Through faith in Jesus Christ. It doesn't say through the church, through baptism, through good works. It says we're children through faith in Jesus Christ. We have been baptized in the union with Christ. We're enveloped by Christ. We are no longer Jews. We're not Gentiles. We're not slaves. We're free. We're just men and women of Christ. We're the same. We're Christians. We are in Jesus Christ. Now, what I love about this, the world is so good at sticking labels on everybody, tags, and everybody does it. But when you come to Jesus, you get to get rid of all the tags. <laughs> Hallelujah. What are you? I'm saved. <laughs> Under the blood of Jesus. I'm a Christian now. Everything's washed, made new, made clean, fresh start life. I'm moving forward. But there's a lot of people in church, that, and I discovered this in 16 years of evangelism. There's a lot of people in church who've been there all their life have never even taken the first step. You know? They've never taken the first step. I can't tell you people I've prayed with and seen make decisions in revivals and crusades over the years who were deacons or Sunday school teachers or people in church. You know, I was in a couple of churches. We saw a pastor saved, now, youth pastors saved, music worship leaders saved. You know, they were in church and going through all the motions, but they'd never really given their life to Christ. They were trying to be better. They were struggling. And boy, what a relief it was for them when they came to the place and realized, I can't do this. I need God. So we always think it's important when talking to people about Believer's Fellowship that they understand clearly what does it mean to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. So according to Romans 10, not to Pastor Joe, not to the Baptist, not to the Methodist, not to the Catholics, but according to the Bible, if you want to know what it means to be saved, it makes it very clear. What does it say? Here's what the Apostle Paul says. What does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and your heart. That's the word of faith that we're preaching. Confess with your mouth Jesus is your Lord. Believe in your heart that God raised from the dead, and you shall be saved. Amen. What's he saying? Something has to happen in your heart. A belief has to get right. Your mind and your heart got to have to change here. And it starts with a change of your, of, of your mind that says, I'm going to listen to the Lord, I'm going to listen to his word, and then I'm going to trust what he says. He goes on in that same passage. He says, it's with the heart you believe. It results in righteousness. With the mouth you confess, that results in salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes in him will not be disappointed. There's no distinction, he said, between the Jews and the Greeks. For the same Lord is the Lord over all, abounding in riches for all who will call upon him. For whoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. How do you be saved? Boom. <laughs> Simple clear, concise. When I held my life up to that as a young man, I said, well, I ain't done that. I didn't believe in my heart. I just tried to quit some stuff and start some stuff. And I gave my life to Jesus. Then the world changed and my life was cleansed. Now, it talks that we had some emphasized words on the screen like salvation and believes and confess and be saved. But what are we believing? All right. And the emphasis is getting a little more clarity in when Paul, when Peter stands up on the day of Pentecost and he kind of gives clarity to what we're believing. He says, let it be clearly known by everyone in Israel that God has made this same Jesus whom you crucified to be both the Lord and Messiah. Amen. And Peter's words, it said, convicted them deep. They were touched in the heart. And they said, brothers, what should we do? And he says, here's what you do. Each one of you must turn from your sins and turn to God and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise, he says, is to you and your children. Let me go back to what, what it says here. He said, this promise is to you and your children. And it finalized that verse. So it says, and Peter continued preaching 
for a long time, strongly urging all his listeners. You think I go for a long time. <laughs> These guys preached so long, people fell out of windows and Amen. were hurt because they went to sleep. The sermons were so long. <laughs> all right, you can bear with me for 45 minutes. The idea behind all this is what, they're, what are they believing? says, they're realizing that Jesus is the Lord, that God really has given us a way of salvation, and it's through Jesus Christ the Lord. And they repent, which is they change their mind. They turn from following themselves, and they turn to following the Lord. And what happens? When that point of my turning to follow Jesus, God does a work in my heart, Amen. and he literally saves me. Now, I know some modern preachers don't like that word save, but that's a perfect word. It's a Bible word. Amen. He saves us. Saves us from what? Saves us from hell. Saves us from eternal death. Saves us from ourselves. Because, you know, nobody does more damage to me than me, all right? And you than you. He saves us from ourselves. So if I have believed the gospel message that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead and he paid the price for my sins and I put my trust in him and confessed him as my Lord and Savior, guess what? I have received him and I've become a Christian. The night I gave my life to Jesus, it was just a simple prayer. And it wasn't even the prayer that saved me. It was the action of giving my heart to him and receiving him by faith. But the prayer was simple. We lead prayer, people in prayers all the time. But a lot of people say, well, I'm saved because I prayed the prayer. No, you're saved because you give your life to Christ. And if you prayed a prayer and didn't give your life to Christ, then you missed the mark. It's not about the words of a prayer. It's about your heart commitment and the confession of your mouth that follows up. I've given you my life, to, I've given you my life today is what I told the Lord. Please forgive me of my sins. I can't live this without you. I don't want to go any further in my life the way I'm living it. Forgive me and come into my life and save me. Well, I want you to know in that moment it was like it was like the weight of the world rolled off my shoulders. I had been so steep and so deep in ungodly living and an ungodly lifestyle to know in that moment that every sin had been eradicated, washed, forgiven, cleansed, not based upon my effort, but based upon what he did for me. That's salvation. So let me take it to the next step. What do people that have been saved, what do people who know Christ, what do believers, Christians, what do they do? Well, here it is again. If you follow the scriptures, they love God, they love people, and they continue to reach the world. Pretty simple, isn't it? So all that stuff you're trying to lay on yourself, make things so hard on yourself, get back to the simplicity of Christ. Just loving God, loving people, reaching the world. Jesus saves us. And when I say do here, what they do, it's not that they do these things to say, I did it, so I'm saved. Or not that they do these things to say, well, I'm spiritually mature now. No, because you can do these things and be without Christ. I believe in things I'm getting ready to read to you from this passage. There's a lot of people who, who don't know Jesus personally, talk about him. I remember one guy told me one time, he said, you know, I used to go to church and you just love to hear sermons. Oh, I love preaching. I love to hear preaching. He said, but I never even give my life to Jesus. I said, there's a lot of people like that. They, they love to hear it. So what, what, did, what, what do we do? Well, let's just wrap this up pretty quick and pretty simple. It says in Acts chapter 2, all those people who believe what Peter said were baptized and they were added to the church. Interesting. They became part of something. 3,000 and all. They joined with other believers. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and devoted themselves to the fellowship. They shared in the Lord's Supper and they prayed together. It goes on to say, and they worshiped together. At the temple every day. They had these large celebrations of worship. They met in homes for the Lord's Supper. They shared their meals with great joy and generosity, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of the people. And each day the Lord added to the group those who were being saved. Amen. Let's encapsulate this real quick. If you're a Christian, you've really given your heart to Jesus, here's what you should be doing, all right? Here's what you should be doing as you go through this process. What do you do? He said, well, first thing they did is they got baptized. You been baptized? These first century believers, they gave their life to Jesus and they followed up with a public confession through baptism. You might say, well, Brother John, I was baptized when I was a kid. Or, My parents had me baptized as an infant. Well, that literally was a dedication or, of you, all right? It's, it's not biblical baptism that follows salvation. This is not something we do before we're saved. Jesus said, you know, you make disciples and after they committed to following me, then you baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teaching to deserve what I've commanded. So baptism, these people didn't have any problem with that. Can you imagine 3,000 people? 
Those who, who have been to Israel and those who are going to, in this, this, uh, this next trip, we'll be on the southern side of the temple, and we'll sit on some steps there. Out in front of those steps, there were all these baptismal pools in the day of Jesus. I think there's still one or two, just kind of the ruins that are there, where they, would, where they would come. And this is where those baptisms would take place. They're all out there getting baptized. And it says, then they started joining and started meeting with other people, and they devoted themselves to the church's ministries. It says they, they met together. They helped each other. They supported the church financially, if you follow the story. They, they gave. They began not only to enjoy what was going on, they supported it. They got in homes. They, they met in small groups. They took communion together. They enjoyed each other, and they praised and enjoyed the Lord for all his blessings. They enjoyed each other. They told people. They shared with their neighbors about Jesus Christ. They shared the gospel wherever they went. Let me give you three statements that wrap all that up real simple. We love God. We'll meet and celebrate and worship together. We love people. So we'll get in our groups and minister to one another in the smaller situations and settings so that we can be accountable and hold others accountable to, to walk with Jesus and to love God so we can help each other. And then we're going to reach the world for Jesus Christ. See how simple that is? What do we do? Let me, let me go back to this one thing about being baptized because there's so many people in churches today who really haven't followed the biblical order of, what it, of, of getting baptized. And I think many times they don't really understand it. The Bible says it's really an illustration of death, the burial, and resurrection. Jesus was basically saying, you get baptized, that's how you identify with me. You know, there's places in the world, if, if you get baptized as a new follower of Jesus Christ, you'll be disowned. You may be killed because the world knows, and those other cultures know, that that stands for a genuine commitment and a lifestyle change and a complete radical reversal of your previous philosophies and ideas and religions. It means now you're following Jesus Christ. So it's an illustration. This, Jesus said, so let them bear witness that they've given. Uh, so as we talk about sharing our faith, the baptismal pulls up one of the first places it becomes obvious that what we've done in our life because it's an illustration. But it also illustrates, you know, that I am this new person. I am in Christ. The Bible says we've been buried with him, we've shared in his death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead, we too can live a new life. All these passages that we're sharing here are talking about a spiritual baptism that takes place. You see, the day you gave your life to Christ, you know what happened? He came into your heart. We use that term a lot. Jesus, let Jesus come into your heart, right? It literally means he comes into your life. You know what also happened? According to the scriptures, you came into his life. You became one with him. The Bible says you're baptized into the body of Christ. You become one with Jesus now. All right? You're one with Christ. He's in you, he's on you, and you're in him. Hallelujah. So the Bible says not only are you in him, it says now you're sealed until the day of redemption. Baptism is a picture of that, that it illustrates this great relationship and this union you now have with the Lord Jesus Christ. So it's important that you, you follow the Lord in baptism. Why? Well, I think a good reason is Jesus was... <laughs> If I'm following Christ, I'm going to follow the example that he said. The Bible says he came from Nazareth. He was baptized in the River Jordan in Mark 1. You say, well, if you think baptism is for children, Jesus is 30 years old at this point, by the way. So have you followed the Lord in biblical scriptural baptism since you've given your life to Jesus Christ? The second reason is he, he commands it. You know what he said in Matthew 28? We read it earlier. He says, those who come to me, those disciples, you know, then, then baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and then teach them the word of God. So this is a command directly from the Lord. That's why we do it. It doesn't make us saved. It's a demonstration, an illustration, and a symbol in clear, vivid color in life that you belong to Jesus Christ now. But also, it's the greatest demonstration that you are a believer. The Bible says many people who heard Jesus believed him, and they were baptized in Acts 18. 1 John 2, we know that we have come to know him if we obey his commands. It's another way to show that I'm following Jesus Christ. Now, at Believer's Fellowship, when we have baptisms, we, we do it up here in this particular baptismal pool up here, and that, that is a pool. So when we baptize people, we immerse them. We don't sprinkle them as some denominations do or pour water over them because the whole idea about baptism is, is understanding what the Bible does say. Jesus was baptized, and when he was baptized, the Bible says in Mark Matthew 3, it says, and Jesus was baptized, and after being baptized, he came up out of the water. If you study, study scripture in Acts where, where Philip goes out and he baptizes the Ethiopian, it says that when he baptized, they went down into the water and Philip baptized him and they came up out of the water. Somebody got in water, not just to pour it on their head. Why? Because the literal word baptized in the original language means to dip under. All right? It means to dip under. It goes under something. 
All right. You know what papacitas, y'all like papacitas? They bring out that little bowl of butter thing. That little. I like to baptize my fajitas. <laughs> I don't sprinkle them. I don't kind of just red towel up. They're, I baptize them. Why? It completely saturates it. My heart probably fails sooner than later. <laughs> but the idea is it goes under. All right? We come to Christ. We have gone under in him. We are in him. And baptism is a picture where we're just immersed in Jesus Christ. It's the best symbol of a burial and the best symbol of a resurrection. In fact, the founders of most denominations agree, even though some of those denominations don't baptize by immersion anymore. It was Martin Luther said, I would have those who are to be baptized to be entirely immersed as that word imports and the mystery signifies. What's it, what's it signify? The burial and resurrection of Jesus. John Calvin said, the word baptize signifies to immerse. It is certain that the immersion was the practice of the ancient church. John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist church, says, buried with him. That passage alludes to baptizing by immersing according to the custom of the first century church. So we believe in baptism. That passage also talked about communion, didn't it? We believe in taking communion together. We do it as a church. We do it in lift groups sometimes. We do it in retreats, men's retreats, women's retreats, different times. We do it as we feel led by the Lord that we would we'd practice communion. Well, what is it? It's like baptism. It is a sacrament. In fact, there's only two. The New Testament talks about baptism and communion. And it, there's only two that Jesus told us to do. I mean, the church can get all kinds of rituals going on, right? But these are only two because both of them are pictures and both of them are testimonies. It's just communion is a simple act that shows us what Jesus underwent on our behalf. It's a, it's a message in symbols with the bread and, 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 and the wine is very clear. The Bible says, and Jesus was betrayed. On that night, he took bread and he took the cup. It reminds us of the grace of God. It reminds us to be thankful for what God has done. When we receive communion at Believer's Fellowship, it's not something we just tag onto a service. It is the service. Because when we take that time to remember all the Lord has done for us, we want it to be the only thing that's focusing our heart and our attention and our mind on, on that that's what it's all about. And it reminds us. But remember, it is a symbol. It's symbolic of how he, his life, just like bread was broken and given out to them to take and eat, his life's been broken. He died on the cross for us and given to each of us to enjoy a new life. His blood has been shed so that we can experience the cleansing blood of Jesus Christ. Even the Apostle Paul, when he talked about it in 1 Corinthians, and all these little verses come out of 1 Corinthians, he said it's a statement of faith. Whenever you eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes back. Jesus is coming back. In the meantime, we're declaring the Lord's, the gospel. How? We do it with our lives. We do it with our words. We do it with symbols of baptism. We do it with the symbols and the sacraments of communion. They all tell the story that Jesus died to save humanity, and we all need him, and we all need to be focused on that message we all need to be living out that message. Jesus didn't tell us in Scripture when to do it in communion. He didn't tell us how often to do it. He just said we should observe it. He said whenever you do observe it, you do it in remembrance of me. So we always want to make it all about Jesus Christ. So let me just close with this last slide I showed you earlier about our purpose statements. We love God. We love people. We reach the world. It's our purpose and it's the process. So when you get to thinking about all the things that church is about and all the things that we're doing in church, because there's a multitude of things that we do around here, your pastor's responsibility is always be examining, making sure that this is what it's all about. Yes. Keeping the flock directed, all right? Keeping the, keeping the sheep moving in the right way. And we'll talk a little bit about that responsibility next Sunday as we talk about the roles of different people and the ministers in the church you know, and the gifts in the church and how we're structured to be biblical and New Testament and how we seek as much as possible, humanly understandable, to do it God's way. Amen. If I fail in your eyes, please understand, I failed seeking to do it what I believe was the Bible way and God's way. That's a commitment I made and others have made in this church over the years. Let's do it God's way. I'm so thankful that first group of people who met back in 1988 and got together at the, you know, Lexington Hotel Suites over there, you know, and said, let's, let's do this and let's just, let's just keep it simple. Let's keep it about Jesus. Let's keep it about loving God, loving people and reaching the world.
making disciples. Don't let that deter you from that. Don't let opinions deter you from that. Don't let attitudes deter you from that. Don't let somebody else, because they didn't measure up to your thought or how you thought it ought to have been, deter you from that. We're about a great work. We're like Nehemiah. I ain't got time for the little stuff. Let's focus on the big stuff. And the big stuff is loving God, loving people, and reaching the world. Amen? Amen. So if anybody asks you this week about your church is all about, what are you going to tell them? <laughs> you guys are the smartest people, too. <laughs> Amen. Let's stand together. Maybe you're here today and you've never given your life to the Lord. Man, I want you to know he loves you. You say, how much? And you can just look to the cross where he bled and died and suffered and paid the greatest price that was ever to be paid. God loves you more than you can probably ever be humanly comprehend. We get so disappointed in life by others and situations. The grace of God will never disappoint you. I encourage you to give your heart and your life to him if you've never done that. Where you go to church is secondary. Primary is giving your life to Jesus Christ. If he should lead you here, praise the Lord. If he leads you somewhere else, praise the Lord. As long as you're where God wants you to be. Amen. But listen, give your heart and life to Christ. People standing in this altar, just come share it with one of them. Say, listen, I want to, I want to give, give my heart to Christ today. I believe Jesus died for my sins, and I want to confess him as my Lord and Savior. We'll rejoice with you and point you in the right direction, point you to the cross of Jesus and pray for you and encourage you. If you're here today and the Lord has spoken to your heart about some of the area of your life and ministry, it's possible. You know, we can speak on a multitude of topics, and God still has a way of getting right to where we are and what my need is. So maybe you just want to come to the altar and find a place between you and the Heavenly Father. This is serious, serious business when it comes to me and him and what I'm being doing in his kingdom. It is with every one of us. So let him direct your heart. Let him shape it if it needs to be reshaped. Let him change where it needs to be changed. Let him tweak those areas in life where we get off. Ask God to cleanse, wash, and forgive. He will. He's committed to you. Maybe there's some other need you want us to pray for. Maybe there's a sickness. I want us to lift up and pray over. You just come. Whatever the need is today, let's, let's turn to the Lord. If you want to bring somebody to the altar to pray with you, feel led to do so. But you come. Let's obey the Lord today. Let's respond to what he said to us. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Amazing That one nailed to a tree. His grace flows down and covers me.
you and we thank you that your grace does flow down and cover us thank you lord jesus Nor do we have the perfect church. We don't have a perfect pastor, perfect deacons, perfect elders, perfect lift leaders, but we're following a perfect Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. And we'll keep our eyes focused on him. And as we do that, it's amazing how much love and grace and unity he'll fill our hearts with. So let's continue to focus on the Lord Jesus Christ and keep him preeminent first and foremost in our lives. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Brother Gary's got a couple of closing announcements, so we'll be dismissed after that. Amen. All right. Newsletter. We are going paperless. Okay, we need to get rid of that back there. That's, I scare myself. All right, I don't need to scare everybody else. Um, in the bulletin, there's a note. We are going paperless. So I encourage, if you have not filled this out, on the back, I think we have your name and email. I encourage everyone to fill this out if you have not done so already. Just to make sure and to ensure that we get your name and email for the newsletter because we are no longer mailing those out. So again, fill this out. Thank you. Um, if you're on Facebook and you cannot fill this out because you're not with us, uh, is it private message, direct message? I don't know. Whatever you do in Facebook to private the church, do that or call with your name and email so that we can get you on the distribution list as well. Men's retreat. April 11th through the 13th at Trinity Pines. Early bird price is $129. If you pay your non-refundable deposit, non-transferable, dep non-refundable, non-transferable deposit of $30 by Sunday, February 24th. After that, the price goes up to $150. There are registration forms in the back. We do have a ministry spotlight. We, the hands of grace and those that participate have been very busy. Um, I know since I've been on staff since March, I think eight, nine funerals. Um, and, and so, and y'all are available. Uh, and so just, I, that's what it is to love God, love people, and reach the world, is to be available. And so Erica, and, and, I, and I know it's not just, it's just, it's not just Erica, it's not, not just a hand, it's a lot of people, because a lot of people provide meals, a lot of people are here to set up, a lot of people are here to serve, a lot of people are here to clean up. It's everybody that participates, that's part of the hands, hands of feet or hands of grace ministry. And so I want to highlight that. So if you want to be a part of that, I know she always emails for, for, um, for food or, or for dishes or for cleanup. That's what it means to love God, love people, and reach the world. Because especially at their most vulnerable and, 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 and time in their life when they've lost a loved one, that we're able to be there and comfort them and, and to love our neighbors. Amen? And so just thank you for everything that y'all do in that ministry. Um, welcome cards. At the beginning of the service, I talked about, if you're new, to uh, complete the welcome card at this time. Uh, well, in a minute, when I dismiss you, please make your way to the Welcome Center. Pastor Joe would love the opportunity to meet you, tell a bit, little, little bit more about our church. Also, Wednesday night, we're going, over the, we're going through the, Paul's letter to the Romans. Medical team meeting, 10 minutes after service. So if you're on the medical team, see Mr. Bill, uh, we're having a meeting after you're having you're having a meeting. I'm not going. You're having a meeting after church. Don't forget your tithes and offering. It's important if, if you're a member uh, and a regular attendant of Believers Fellowship, support our church 
and we do that through our tithes and offerings. We don't pass a plate. We have off offering receptacles in the back. Uh, that is an act of worship, and so you do take that, that time uh, as important as, as you continue and, and be a cheerful giver, amen? We, we get, sometimes we get checks where the little corner's cut off where you still have it in your hands because you're not quite wanting to give it away, but be a cheerful giver, amen? If you're on Facebook or if you are here and you give online through our PayPal, they charge us 3%. So if you give online through PayPal or if you're on Facebook and you give through PayPal, add 3%. Amen? It, it just helps us out because we have to pay. The church has to pay for it, right? And so if you give online giving, just make sure it's, it's $3 to the 100. I'm not going to go any smaller than that. So $3 to the 100. So amen. All right. So if you're on Facebook, thank you so much for joining us. With that, we have lift groups tonight, uh, Awanas, youth. With that being said, you are dismissed.